So ionization is an important property of atoms. So it measures how hard or how easy it is to pull one electron off of an atom. But it turns out it might be nice to have a measure of the average strength which an atom holds on to its valence electrons. Now we care about valence electrons because they're on the outside of the atom. So if two atoms are going to interact, say to form a bond, that's going to happen on the outside of the atom. So it's the valence electrons that we care about. And we really care about how tightly does any particular atom hold on to any electrons that happen to be in its valence shell. So whether an electron is trying to be pulled away by another atom, or perhaps an electron is trying to be donated by another atom. You know, how strong does an atom pull on those valence electrons? So we can measure that property with something called average valence electron energy, or AVEE for short. So let's consider how we might calculate the average valence electron energy for carbon. So here's the electron configuration for carbon, 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. So the valence shell is the n equal 2 shell, which has the two subshells, the s subshell and the p subshell. So we've got a total of four valence electrons. If we look at the photoelectron spectrum for carbon, it might look something like this. So relative number of electrons is on the y-axis. Ionization energy is increasing from right to left in megajoules per mole. And so we see a, a peak that's about two units high at 28.6 megajoules per mole. Then there's a big gap, and we see another peak that's two units high at 1.72 megajoules per mole. And a last peak that's also two units high at 1.09 megajoules per mole. And last, furthest on the right here, I have a picture of what the uh, shell model might look like. So we've got a plus six nuclear charge. The 1s electrons are in that first ring there, two. Then we've got the n equal two shell, and I've drawn it as though there were two really close shells here. And we put two electrons in the 2s shell, which is a little bit closer to the nucleus maybe, and two electrons in the outer shell. So what we want to do is calculate the average ionization energy of the electrons that are in the valence shell. So that's what we call AVEE. -E. So let's figure out how we would do that calculation. So we've got two electrons in the 2s shell. So I'm going to take two and I'm going to multiply it by the energy it would require to remove those electrons. So we're trying to calculate the average ionization energy of these electrons. So we've got two that have this ionization energy, 1.72 megajoules per mole. And then we're going to add to that the ionization energy for the 2p electrons. And so we've got two 2p electrons, and they have an ionization energy of 1.09 megajoules per mole. And so how do we calculate an average? We add up all the energies for each of the 2s and each of the 2p, and then we divide by the total number of electrons. And so there are four total electrons in the um, n equal two valence shell for carbon. And so we just do the math here, and we calculate an AVEE of 1.41 megajoules per mole. We can do the same thing for other atoms, so let's imagine calculating the AVEE for fluorine as another example. So here's the electron configuration for fluorine. It has the n equal two valence shell has seven electrons in it, and then we would know, need to know the ionization energy from the photoelectron spectra of these two energy levels, and they turn out to be 3.88 and 1.68 megajoules per mole. So we can calculate the AVEE just like we did for carbon by just averaging the energies, the ionization energies, of all the electrons in the valence shell. So we've got two electrons that have an ionization energy of 3.88 megajoules per mole. We're going to add to that five electrons that have an ionization energy of 1.68 megajoules per mole. And then we divide by the total number of electrons. So five plus two is seven. We've got seven valence electrons in fluorine. And so that gives us a value of 2.31 megajoules per mole. All right, so what do these two numbers tell us? Well, these numbers tell us two things. First, they tell us about the strength of the attraction of the atom to its valence electrons. And so that was the quantity that we wanted to know. We wanted to know a measure of how strong it is. And so looking at fluorine and carbon, we can see that uh, fluorine has a much stronger attraction for its valence electrons as compared to carbon. In fact, it's almost twice. So fluorine atoms really hang on tightly to any electron that might be in its valence electron shell. Now the second thing that AVEE tells us, and you may have kind of noticed that already, is the difference between the energies in the two subshells.
So for example, in carbon, the difference between 1.72 and 1.09 is much smaller than what we have in fluorine, the difference between 3.88 and 1.68. So that's the second piece of information that we get from AVEE. So it tells us the difference in energy between the subshells of the valence shell. So the bigger the AVEE, the bigger the difference in energy of the two subshells. To show you that difference in energy and how it varies as we go across the periodic table, let's look at this graph. So this graph shows us the ionization energy that we would measure from photoelectron spectra in megajoules per mole for these different atoms, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. And so you see that for boron, the 2s and 2p ionization energies are fairly close together. And as we move along this row, the periodic table, along this period, you see that this gap begins to widen. And so that's going to correlate with an increase in the average valence electron energy. So you see that the gap spreads out as we move along the periodic table, that it's narrow at the beginning of the row, and it increases as we go further and further down the row. So those are the two things that AVE measures for us. Let's look at the periodic trends in AVEE. So this table corresponds to figure 3.31 in your textbook. actually shows the average valence electron energies for some various atoms in the periodic table. So we've got uh, one row of the transition metals here, a little piece of that, but everything else are for the main group elements. So if we plot those as a bar graph in sort of this three-dimensional representation, you can clearly see the trend in AVEE. So as we move from one corner of the periodic table to the opposite corner of the periodic table, AVEE tends to increase. So AVEE increases across a row of the periodic table, and it decreases down a column of the periodic table, generally speaking. So there are a few little blips, maybe, but, but generally speaking, that happens. So another thing that you'll notice is that these things that are over here in this part of the periodic table tend to have pretty high AVEEs. And what do we know about those things in this part of the periodic table? Well, they're nonmetals. They all tend to have AVEEs that are greater than about 1.26 megajoules per mole. So maybe it is the thing that makes nonmetals nonmetals is that they hold really tightly to their valence electrons. And so they have really tight hold on those valence electrons, so maybe those electrons can't leave the atom very easily and do things that we know metals do, like conduct electricity. By contrast, these elements that are down here, and let's leave hydrogen out of the mix for now, and we'll talk about hydrogen in the middle. We know that these guys are metals. And so metals are going to have average valence electron energies that are a bit less than, say, 1.07 megajoules per mole. In between, then, right here, are the semi-metals, or metalloids. And they have properties in between metals and non-metals. So these are going to have average valence electron energies in between, say, 1.07 and 1.26 megajoules per mole. And so anything that has AVEEs in that range, we're going to call them semi-metals. And so they're not so good at having electrons being taken off, but they're not terrible either, right? So it's not super hard, but it's not super easy. They're kind of in between. And so that's consistent with our understanding of what these guys are. So if we look at hydrogen, you see that hydrogen has an AVEE of 1.31 megajoules per mole. That's up here in this table. And so that's really close to boron and carbon. So it's right in this region. So it's almost the same as a semi-metal. So maybe it's not surprising that hydrogen has properties in between those two. Now, most of us think of hydrogen because under atmospheric pressure and temperature, hydrogen exists as a diatomic gas. And that's kind of a property of some nonmetals. We know some other nonmetals like N2 and O2 and F2 and Cl2 all exist as diatomic gases. So that's kind of consistent with thinking of hydrogen as a nonmetal. But it's really interesting that if you take hydrogen and you squeeze it down under really high pressure so that you're pushing those atoms together, elemental hydrogen actually becomes a metal. This actually happens in the core of giant planets like Jupiter and Saturn, where the weight of all that stuff on the outside of the planet pushes down on hydrogen in the interior of the planet, crushing it into metallic hydrogen. We can reproduce that in the lab in a special apparatus, and we can actually measure the electrical conductivity of metallic hydrogen 
and it's very high. So hydrogen is an unusual element in that it has that kind of intermediate behavior, and the AVEE shows that. So it gives us a metric, a way of, of calculating that. So um, that's a very interesting property of hydrogen. And so that's how AVEE relates to what we call metallicity. So metallicity is a word that means metallic character. And what we see is that the lower the AVEE, the higher the metallicity. So things that are really metallic, down here in this corner of the periodic table, right down here, those are going to be very good metals, very good conductors of electricity, conductors of heat, that kind of thing. So you're going to have properties that are very metal-like, whereas things up here in this corner of the periodic table will be very non-metal-like.